Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a Monday morning, 10 o'clock. And today um, on the middle way, we're going to talk about the future world. We talk about personalization of automation. Um, and we have uh, Chang Wang and Martin Hindman. This is a continuation of the discussion we started before. We're going to talk about how automation will affect society at large and um, you know the, the political structure of society at large. Uh, we're going to talk about the use of personal information and preferences and how important they are in determining complex decision-making processes, the role of machine learning inferences based on predefined persona types and privacy concern, talk about that too. Um, so there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot to be concerned about. And the question ultimately is should the pursuit of automation alert social policymakers and the law to potentially intervene through regulation? On what legal grounds, what actions or events should be monitored? These are really difficult questions. So, Chang, can you talk about you know, how you see this topic unfolding? And you, can you make a reintroduction, reintroduction of Martin Hindman, please? Absolutely. Martin is an expert in automation and machine learning. And he has been a, a senior manager with Thomson Reuters for many years, and later with other uh, big companies like 3M. He was my first boss when I entered the corporate America, and I learned so much from him. And today, I still consider he is my boss. But I had the privilege <laughs> to, uh, to continue to learn from Martin and invite Martin to your show to talk about uh, his uh, uh, domain of expertise. And I'm fascinated by automated, uh, automation, machine learning, and AI. And I want to, I want to just a quick, uh, I have some burning questions for both of you. First of, you, first of all, I want to uh, share some of my thoughts from my most recent two-month trip overseas. So what strikes me to see that there's a sharp contrast between the United States and beyond the border. So in this country, it, there has been always a very deep distrust of government. You, you probably remember Ronald Reagan said that the government is, uh, cannot solve the problem government is a problem. And this is just a completely, this statement that's a completely unsustainable from you know, non-Americans. And, and so uh, what do you mean, you know, government is a problem? Uh, but because of this deep distrust, there are you know, two sides of the sword. One, on, on the one hand, we can't really have, you know, a uh, herd community, have everybody vaccinated. On the other hand, uh, we are, our privacy are well, very well protected. It, it, it don't think about invasion of privacy and to sell your personal data. And I had a chance to talk with general counsel of an uh, international corporation, a non-American, and he's addicted to sell personal data, to commercialize the personal data. And it's just a completely contrast. And, and, and they don't really worry about, you know, the uh, control, uh, 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 you know, dictatorship, or whatever. They think that personal data is gold. Uh, the data is a new uh, code. So I, I just am curious. Uh, what's your general comments on 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 this deep, you know, contrast between the American attitude toward privacy and the government control versus uh, you know overseas uh, other countries' attitude? Uh, go ahead, Martin. Answer that. We only have six hours. Yeah, exactly. Um, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Junk. Um, I better just um, set the scene here. I'm a, I'm a product developer by background. I'm not an attorney. I'm certainly not a expert in, in privacy, security, governance, governance regulation, but I've been working with customer data for over 30 years. And I remember back to the 1990s when the internet was really just a stumbling platform where I was having to take customer data in in relational tables and work it, massage it, clean it, manipulate it, and then use it uh, for what I was considered, considering to be value-added service. Now, fast forward 30 years, I don't think I could get, get away with any of those tasks uh, right now. And in some fashion, it's, good, it's a good thing, but it's, lim it's certainly limiting uh, innovation. So from where I'm sitting, the question I think uh, back to you, Jung, is what is the role of innovation 
between those two systems, the US driven commercial uh, exploitation system, and then China as a, a system of government. I, I mean, I, I think both countries are innovative, but perhaps they're innovative, innovative in different ways when you look through the lens of, of privacy of, um, of um, customer and individual um, uh, people's data. W would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. And uh, there are definitely there are different purpose, but the ultimate purpose of how to use the data and what ultimately you want to achieve, you want to accomplish by uh, exploiting or utilizing those data. Uh, so I, I'm not an expert of automation and machine learning. That is your expert. I just feel like we don't really need to commercial. It's China is a big innovator of that. But the um, uh, United States is a big innovator of that. But uh, I think to me as a customer, as a consumer, Almost most innovation are not impacting, uh, in my view, is unnecessary. So, so I think, <laughs> to go back to the US, I, I think um, all companies are driven by a concept called digital transformation. And I've got a slide which I like to use, which I think underpins most um, organization investment strategies of trying to get closer to their customer by collecting data on those customers. And it, it goes without saying that the more you know about your customers, the more you can add value or develop products which your customers will want to buy. But there are some uh, digital transformation concepts about the way that you collect that data, the way that you normalize that data, the way you deploy AI, or what I prefer to use machine learning on that data, which I think is very much driven by the goals of the organization. And Mark Benioff, who is the CEO of a company called Salesforce, is very much driven by the need to focus in on individual requirements, individual needs. You have to know much more about those individuals than you do um, at the moment in terms of purchasing behavior. Um, there's a lot of um, behavioral data in the way that you visit websites, the way you use your mobile phone, which on the surface may not tell you too much about the individual's goals and aspirations. But when you collect it over time, you aggregate it, you connect it to other data sets on that individual, whether it be their Facebook page, other social media platforms, you start to get much more of a, what I'll call a snowflake vision or a, a snowflake picture um, of that person. And and then being able to ask, what do I know about this person in terms of providing um, additional value around the products they already buy or potential products I can develop for them in the future? Um, you know, I get, I get a creepy feeling down the back of my neck with all this. You know, there was a time when privacy and the right of privacy was a real right, that you could say no, that you could holler and scream and say, get away from my private information. Um, but I think most people have succumbed to that now. They they have gone, you know, into the forest here, knowing that there are traps all around, people gathering data on them, and and not only gathering data, but selling the data, putting the data out there. So you know, it's like you're under a microscope your whole life, and that that phenomenon is increasing. I was telling you guys before the show began um, that I had an unpleasant experience with uh, Amazon Web Services today. All my experiences with Amazon Web Services are unpleasant. And, and what I take out of that, by the way, is that you, know, you talk about Benioff and trying to tailor uh, his pitch to the individual. That's the exception, not the rule. The rule is that I, I am not a customer. It's not a customer-oriented society anymore. It's a, 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 it's a, a demographically-oriented uh, society. In other words, if I have um, you know, 10 million users, 10 million mm, people signed up, members, what have you, um, I don't care about the one. I don't care how people feel. If they don't like me, I don't care. All I care is having the most of the million. And then I'll sell my company. I'll sell my data. It doesn't matter if people like me very much. All I have to do is speak to the masses. The individual becomes less important. 
I don't know if you guys agree with me, but that's my personal experience. I do not feel that the system we have achieved now, using data, gathering data, using AI, examining hundreds of millions of people and personal data records uh, is oriented toward the individual. The individual has been lost in all this. Yeah, I, I think we're going through the bumpy road, the bumpy road of a, of a new industrial revolution where user data, as, as Chung was saying, is the new coal or the new oil uh, for the system. But we haven't really got any good examples to show people show that the future is actually bright and does protect the individual. It's very much a um, in the early uh, stages of trying to work out what that industry uh, looks like, behaves like, and how it should be regulated. It's very much like the early days of the internet. Um, the same concerns were, were around back in 93, 94, 95. I had plenty of people telling me that it was both a uh, a blessing and a curse, um, but both extremes. And I think um, you're, you're talking to the same same tune, Jay. Well, I think, you know, in, in our introduction to this, um, we raised, you raised, Chang, the, um, the, the possibility, the need for regulation. Uh, this is a problem in a, in a First Amendment um, society, theoretically. I think our First Amendment is going away, but hey, um, it's going away in a lot of places, so <laughs> can't get too upset about that. Um, but, you know, in a First Amendment society, it's very hard to regulate free speech, isn't it? And you talk about the word regulation. How exactly in a perfect world or in a world that we think might be perfect, um, can we regulate the collection of data, the right of privacy, which is not entirely, you know, recognized? Um, how can we Mm, have government step in on this because government hasn't effectively, may I say this, may I say this on the air here together, gentlemen, government has not effectively stepped in on this at all. Following up what Jay just asked, I have a also have a tough question for marketing as well. Are all the innovation needed or they are basically innovated to create more desire to buy and to consume. And so if it's a, innovation is geared toward to improve people's life, to, to make our life easier, to make medical you know, better, to make a, the environment better, then I'm all for it. But if the innovation is mostly to create more desire for the consumer to spend, to buy, and a more opportunity for the um, big techs to, to sell. And I'm, I'm not sure about that. For Let's example, talk, yeah. yes, go ahead, please. Let's Marty. talk about a specific example. I, I mentioned this on the last, uh, last call. Um, autonomous vehicles will have the capability to interact with signs, signage, road, road markings, and other roadside uh, devices. And um, a use case that was recently discussed in Minnesota was what happens when an autonomous vehicle is crossing state lines between, say, North Dakota and Minnesota or Wisconsin and Minnesota? What happens would various agencies like there to be between an autonomous vehicle and signage? Right? Now it's not just it's not just directions, obviously. Um, it could be local hotels, restaurants, it could be um, health providers. Uh, the list of companies that would like to be in that conversation goes on and on and on. But from the driver's point of view, or not the driver, but the person in the car, what are the use cases that they would find um, valuable as they go through uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin state line, or something happens to them, they break down, or there's an, a medical emergency, what data would they like to transfer between the autonomous vehicle and the IoT or the device which is going to connect that vehicle to Minnesota's infrastructure. So that's, I mean, you can see where I'm going with that, mm -hmm. right? Well, so, that's all positive. That's all positive. I, I, you know, cars come with that now, right? If your car breaks down, um, it'll send a message, and uh, you know, before you know it, there'll be a tow truck or an ambulance, whatever is necessary. It's, this is wonderful. Nobody would argue with that. 
Where I get stuck on it is that they get in inside your mind and it goes further than retail. Let me, let me open a subject with you guys, see how you feel about it. There was recently an article in one of the tech um, journals that I get about, um, it was about a social media organization and I forget which one it was um, that played movies. Okay? And um, if you click on a movie and you watch it for 10 seconds or 20 or a minute or two, it keeps a record of that. And the next time you get um, a message from this particular social media, it's going to be based on what you did in the previous movie. It is developing a, uh, developing a profile of you on your taste. How, how much interest do you have in this subject? And the movies test you. They test you on your subject. So as you go down the, the path, the, all the movies you get are based on the movies you've already seen. It knows you. It knows your personality, knows, your, knows you know, what you're interested in, and it knows your politics. It knows your philosophy. It knows your ideology. It knows everything about you by virtue of the express tastes that you, that you act on when you select these movies. Now, I don't mind retail. I, most people don't. Um, but I do mind that they're keeping book on me. And they're going, now they're going to send me, like Vladimir Putin is going to send me stuff, okay, that, um, that tends to divide me from others, that tends to play on that taste. And we know already that Mark Zuckerberg has sold him information through Cambridge Analytica. Um, and we know that he's collecting it in other ways through ERA. Um, and, you know, he knows too much about me. Okay, it's not just me, though. Remember, this is a demographic experience. It, I, me alone, I'm not consequential, but 300 million people are consequential. And if I know how they feel as a group, if I can do this kind of, what do you want to call it, survey of public opinion, I can shift public opinion. I can sway, I can create public opinion. That is much more of much more concern than retail and, and having someone send a tow truck. So, so there are definitely tools needed to protect your own data. And uh, there's an article um, came out a couple of um, uh, years ago by uh, Tyler Wellmans from uh, Deloitte that talks about needing to um, bring in the element of trust in your interactions with, um, whether it be Netflix, AWS. And you shouldn't have to do that yourself. You shouldn't have to decide whether or not you, you trust these vendors on an individual basis. You need your own version of automation, which has been watching the way that you react to things like your Netflix choices. You can, you can downgrade them as a trusted vendor if you want to, and then your automation refuses to connect or even share your user data with that vendor next time you connect. So those tools don't exist right now. You, you need protection. You need automation to protect your user uh, profile and the data. Um, so in a way, it's one-sided right now. Anytime you interact, then there's not enough regulations to prevent the vendor just taking whatever they like. Um, so you're, you're right. But, but I think those, there is a commercial angle to this. What would happen if at some point you felt the problem was so, um, was so acute you needed a service um, to protect you. Would you think there would be vendors interested in developing that service for you that would protect you, protect your data, and then would you buy it? And then I'm already at that point, Mark. Mark. Yeah. I would buy that service today. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is you <clears throat> that commercially and you know, conceptually uh, in the business world, you have to somehow in, insinuate that service between me and all these people who want my data. Yeah. And, and uh, I would agree, but with they, how do you actually insinuate it? And, um, you know, to your point, uh, Chang, is, is government necessary to facilitate that insinuation, to encourage, to support, incentivize somebody to come along and be my, my gatekeeper? So interesting in terms, I did ask a, a friend of mine who was a security expert, which area is moving forward with the most regulation around privacy right now? And he, he um, pointed me towards the federal regulation for uh, student privacy, FERPA. It's a federal agency. Um, and there have been 140 new laws um, passed in the last uh, 
eight years, um, which are protecting student privacy. And is that federal or state, Martin? Yeah, uh, is it? Okay. Is that federal or state? Okay. I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not familiar with it, um, other than that it's very active and it puts the, um, uh, the responsibility of protecting students and students' data on the school district or the school institution. And FERPA is really only guidance. It's um, uh, the laws have been coming out at the local level, state level, and, uh, and it's, 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 being, it's frenetic. Uh, a, um, and it's causing problems for the educational uh, technology companies because they're just not able to get the data now that they were getting, you know, five, ten years ago to normalize their own their own technology and products. So uh, that seems to be moving the the fastest by now. So if it starts in education, uh, maybe it will um, spread to other 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 sectors naturally. I think there's money to be made here. If somebody came to me and said, look, we will be the gatekeeper for you. We will protect your privacy. Uh, we will let you choose whether they're you know, getting data from you. And for this, you have to pay $10 a month or whatever. Um, I would pay that handily because, because uh, I, I'm, as I said, I'm getting that creepy feeling. Um, I'm not sure that it would work without government intervention. What do you think, Chang? Is government intervention necessary to make the gatekeeper work? It is it's a terrific question, but I don't think I have an answer for that. And for in this country, we, we don't trust government to do, uh, we, we protect ourselves mostly from the government. So it's, uh, it's very hard to, uh, for the government to uh, the federal level, from the federal level to reach to the state level and the local level. And uh, he's right, isn't he, Martin? He's right. Government, government's not the one to do that. If I'm looking for a gatekeeper, a commercial gatekeeper that I pay, a business, a public company, for example, that's all over the world, uh, that says we, we will protect your data, um, that has to be a competitive, effective, um, high technology AI kind of software that will come and protect me. It's so you know what it's like. It's like spam, the spam companies, none of which are that good, by the way. <laughs> but but it's like that same kind of protection they might offer you, and they got to be good. Yeah, I I would like as a product developer, I would like for companies to take the responsible line and to protect and to and promote it as part of the service. We protect your data, and this is there's transparency on how we're using your data to provide better services. However, um, as you may have seen in the news recently, there's this concept of um, coded bias, where organizations who are not particularly uh, up to speed with machine learning and, what, and how you model data, and the, the ethical and moral issues of protecting um, the individual within these models, who are, who are blatantly misusing uh, this data to get the, the result thereafter, at the expense of the welfare of individuals and recent examples where uh, algorithms have been developed to, um, to uh, provide uh, insights on a person's ability to do their job. And these algorithms have been uh, weak in certain areas and the data has been used to essentially fire um, what are considered to be underperforming uh, individuals. But actually when, you, when they look through the records of the individual, uh, the algorithm is saying they are, are underperforming, but the actual evidence uh, suggests otherwise. So or it's problems. racist. Or, it's, or yeah, it, it turns out to be racist. There's been a lot, of, a lot of press about that. Exactly, exactly. So, so you, these tools, like any tool, can be used for good or bad. And in the hands of people who don't understand the data, and it comes down to the data at the end of the day, uh, mistakes can be made and they can have uh, you know, costly consequences. So now in those, those instances, I think there is a role for the government or, or a state legislature. Um, well, you know, the thing is that you talk about algorithm, okay? An algorithm could be, um, you know, millions of lines of code. <clears throat> and you can see easily how it could spin into millions of lines of code. Um, how can you get people, anyone, a regulator, an individual, the government, somebody, to look at the algorithm? 
to have first to have access to it because Mark Zuckerberg is not going to give you his algorithm voluntarily. Okay, but somebody should look at it and see if it's racist or unfair, um, or he's you know selling conclusions that are you know destructive. Um, so I think, yeah. how, how do we open the algorithm up? Yeah, no, it, it's actually possible, but you use uh, training data. So uh, these algorithms don't do anything on their own. They have to use utilize data. So what you tend to do is you take a, a model where the data has either been corrupted on be you know, on purpose, and you test those algorithms against the corrupted data to see the output. And you test the algorithm based on that, um, both from a positive and a negative point of view. Um, so those algorithms can be tested as long as the data is transparent and understood. Where it gets a bit tricky is if these algorithms are running on what I'll call unstructured data, where the data is not really understood. Um, then, then that's more difficult because it's you you can't really reverse engineer back into the data because the, the algorithms are sort of trying to make sense of the data, if you like, and then uh, using predictive algorithms coming up with a, an outcome based on you know the, the logic, if you like, uh, of how they're making sense of the data. But, but you can test uh, algorithms which have been organized properly to interrogate structured data, data which is understood. Mm, that, that sounds hopeful. But I, I want to ask you both this question. You know, we need to address this. I think I think that's unanimous. Um, but is it too late? Uh, is it you know is it too late, for example, to deal with people who use this kind of data in a political environment as a political? And may I say, weaponize uh, as a political weapon for elections? to change minds, to create uh, divisiveness, um, because it's hard to reach them. It's hard to lobby against a company that has billions to spend in lobbying against you. It's hard to change the law in favor of the public good when there are companies that are so big and so wealthy, so cash loaded, um, that you, you can't compete with them in a legislative forum, um, how how can we how can we make progress on this? What's the leverage against a company that is so big, or a bunch of companies that are so big that they're virtually untouchable? I don't I don't think it's too late. I think we just started the the journey of knowing what our individual digital identity is in an interconnected ecosystem. Social media is part of that ecosystem, but there are other um, data-driven platforms like government platforms um, and professional network platforms, um, which I think will ultimately um, supersede all of the, you know, the the things that are going on that we don't we don't agree with. I think professional networks. I mean, I go back to the start of the publishing industry in the 17th century. Uh, I mean, sorry if I've uh, told this story on the last talk, but after the Great Fire of London in 1666, the insurance markets were completely re reinvented around the coffee shop houses because they were the first establishments to get back into business after, uh, after London was, was burned to the ground. And those coffee shop houses had a strict policy of who could go in. You couldn't just go in as a general public. You had to be a professional broker or a professional underwriter to go into the coffee shop and interact with other professionals in the insurance industry. And that's essentially the beginning of Lloyd's of London, which is the international institution for large-scale insurance uh, contracts. Which is Actually, they've been in trouble in recent years, haven't they? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but, uh, the, point, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, uh, when, when there is lack of trust, you will find that new networks emerge to reestablish trust amongst its members. And so I think that's what, that's what will happen in this case. Martin, isn't, isn't it really um, about transparency? I mean, you get oh, to trust absolutely. through transparency. So for example, why, why can't I get on, why can't I get on the, um, the, the, the internet and ask Amazon Web Services for all the data they have on me, everything? 
every every piece of data they've ever collected on me. And the same thing with Google, which probably has much more data than Amazon does. And the same thing with Facebook and social media. I want it all. And, you know, I may be lazy, not go through it, all this, but at least I have it all. Um, could we get to a point where they would do that voluntarily? Yes, I think, I think, they, I think they have to. I think also it has to be a red delete button. If you feel that, you know, for whatever reason, they've got too much or they're using it in the wrong way, what would happen if they said, fine, you can delete it. Here's the button. But before you press that delete button, here are the services which will no longer function uh, on your behalf. You will become essentially somebody with no credit history. Uh, you'll have to you know, build up all this user data to get the kind of uh, predictive algorithms to work in your favor. But maybe you're not impressed with those services. So you'll go straight to that delete button and press it every couple of weeks. Um, but it's the, then the challenge is up for, for Google or AWS to provide those services, which prevents you from deleting that user data because otherwise it won't work. Yeah. Well, on the one hand, you may not have a tow truck coming your way, but on the other hand, um, you might you might achieve something we all we all envy, and that's uh, uh, what was it Thoreau in Walden Pond, um, living quietly, isolated from society. Oh God, if we could only get back to that now, it's yeah. it's no longer available anywhere in the world. <laughs> so, just, just to just to give you a small uh, a small story from my own. Uh, recent uh, history. So I've started coaching at the University of Minnesota. Um, um, I'm a, an assistant rowing coach. And uh, I got, you know, I've been rowing for 40, 40 years. So it's something I've always wanted to do, you know, particularly as I, as I, you know, getting into retirement. And uh, I was contacted by the university office um, to provide uh, metadata on the COVID, uh, COVID boosters. But not just that, there's also something called US Safe Sport, which they need at least 10, 15, 20 years history of interactions with teenagers. Well, I've been in corporate America, I have no interactions. So a red flag went up and they asked me, you know, if I'm so uh, passionate about coaching, uh, you know, teenage, essentially 18, 19 year olds, how is it I've not had uh, any US um, data? Um, and so I'm in this red flag situation where, and I am a, actually a qualified high school teacher in the UK. So I actually have had um, plenty of interactions with, with students, um, but it's not in the US, so it doesn't count. So the fact there's an absence of data has created a red flag to be attached to my, to my University of Minnesota uh, employee, employee record. Mm. You might you might somehow have a knock on the door from the absence of data police. <laughs> they may be coming for you. <laughs> what, what is wrong with Martin? Um, so let me let me uh, let me offer this though. Now, right now we have this all this strange stuff going on around vaccines and masks, and it's, you know it's political. Arguably, uh, some people truly, you know, sincerely believe uh, in some religious exemption, or they believe in liberty and freedom from vaccines and all that. But the, you know, the better government policy is if you want to save um, you know, seven or 800,000 lives, um, then you, know, you have to do something and you have to require things and you have to make sure that everybody follows the, the science. A lot of people don't want their medical data um, you know, to collect it either individually or as a, a, a demograph. You know? anonymously. They don't want to collect it because they have political or religious you know, ob objection to that. Seems to me that there is no question if you're going to save seven or 800,000 lives, you have got to collect that data. Um, and you don't, in, in a way, I mean, I would say you have to collect it individually. That's the whole point of, of testing, to know individually who may be exposed. So where are we going with that, Martin? Um, and it seems to me there are situations, especially in public health, where we really need to have it. We need government to get it. Yeah, I mean, this is a great topic. Um, I wish I had something uh, insightful to say. I'm, I'm, watch I'm, I'm watching on the sidelines side as well, Jay. I think it's going to be fascinating to see how the US government sort of 
you know, squares a circle around all of the uh, freedoms that we expect to have around our data and then the public health debate. I mean, it's still in progress, right? It's still, this is still game on. It's um, in progress while people are dying. That's, you know, the question right. there again is, do we have the time? Right. Yeah. Where, where should it be, Jay? Should it be at the federal level or should individual states uh, weigh in on this? Well, I think one of the failures of the constitution, sorry, was this thing about federalism. And I think the GOP now is, is driving a truck through that, uh, has been driving a truck through it for the, the past 50 years. Federalism is just an escape from the common good. Um, so my, my own view is that um, if we had a constitutional convention or a reform of our constitution, that would be one thing I would look at right away. I don't like it anymore, if I ever did. You've got, Sorry. You've got two foreigners on the, on the call here, Jay, who, who have a ton of respect for America's constitution. So I, I don't know about you, Chung, but I, I couldn't uh, criticize uh, any, <laughs> anything that's going on, could you? Well, let, on a positive note, I just want to tell you that uh, I do not share the deep distrust in the government. And I'm not a big fan of the government, but I do respect the government. And I can tell you my per from my personal experience, how it feels when the government works very well. When I landed in San Francisco International Airport from a flight uh, from Hong Kong, and I landed, I walk out of my, uh, take my luggage, and then walked in front of a kiosk for global entry, for a trusted traveler program. And I have my face recognized, print out a little slip, hand the slip to the officer nearby, and just walk out. And then take a cab, check in my hotel. From touchdown of landing, to walk in my hotel room 45 minutes. And that is just uh, the future world for me should look like that. You know, you have, you have total confidence in government, you have total confidence in technology. I'm not sure that it's just a short-lived daydream, or that is our future. But I'm going to bet on the positive side of that. Well, that actually takes me to a thought I'd like to leave you both with. And that is, um, and I've always felt that uh, this, this, goes, this goes to the practice of law, that you could have a judge in a little black box about the size of a Rubik's cube. Okay? And you feed in the, the evidence, you feed in the arguments, and the little black box makes an unerringly, unerringly correct decision. I know that doesn't take into account the, the frailties of humanity and all the, you know, the special aspects of our species, but you could build that in. You can make an algorithm with millions of lines of code, and that little black box would give you a better percentage of correct decisions, okay? Take the same idea to government. Okay, now I have a, a bigger black box. And I put it in Washington, D.C., and I feed in all the data, including the data that's appropriate from you know, our transactions in our lives. And, and I have that make policy. Uh, frankly, I think, A, it would be able to do that. Right now, we have trouble doing that. And B, it would be correct most of the time. If you put the norms in the box, the box will give you the norms back. Don't you think that's the future? Martin, what do you think? Yeah, I do. If, if it's a process that can be written down, if there are rules which can be defined around that process, then what you're describing is absolutely possible. Wow. <laughs> and Chang? <laughs> Sounds great to me. We look forward to that. Yeah, what about your law practice, huh? Yeah, it's a... Well, I, I, I know AI is replacing law practice in some areas. But there are two areas I, I have a total confidence and that the AI will never replace. Martin can correct me. One is constitutional law and, and one is immigration law because both, part, uh, both areas need a very strong level, very high level of empathy, which the machine learning hasn't been able to achieve. The machine have very high IQ, but they don't have a lot of EQ. So whenever you need EQ, the machine is at a disadvantage. Advantage. But I'm going to leave that to Martin for comment. The, the human condition can never be 
fully automated, I think is what you're saying. Good to um, know. Yeah, I, if you agree. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but, Martin, but Martin, can't we, and empathy is rational. Empathy is uh, something you can, you know, you can actually write it down, what's empathetic and what's not. Why can't I put that in the algorithm? If, if there are rules associated with the decision process you make when you empathize, then that's true. But is the, is the level of complexity around these cases on something that can always be written down and you see it repeat over and over again? Or is it always something that comes up at the last minute, a new variable or a new piece of information which changes everything? I keep thinking of the words of <clears throat> in 2001, a space oddity, Hal, I can't do that for you, Hal. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> yeah. <Stanley> Kubelik. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think it's time to summarize. Well, well, this is that. not going to be easy for you. <laughs> and yeah. and Mark, close the show, Jack. <laughs> well, I will gonna leave it there to our expert, Martin. Martin, you do summarize that. So, so, so I think we're starting a really fascinating journey where the there's been um, innovation coming from pure technology, uh, collecting data in new ways, access to data, which has never been possible before. And then society at large has to prioritize how we're going to use these new tools to benefit us as a society, as a collective, and then maintaining that, that personal freedom at the heart. So I don't think there are any any immediate answers right now, it's going to be fascinating to see and whether it comes from the educational uh, angle or it comes from healthcare, there's going to be some, some event. Um, I, know, I don't think it's actually COVID. There's going to be some other event which um, brings us into that new industrial uh, revolution uh, that we're all, that, that, that we've been promised from Tesla and others, but we're not there yet. So it's, you know, stay tuned, I guess, is the summary and, and see how the world is going to unfurl over the next um, couple of years in this space. Yeah, and we'll see how Amazon Web Services treats me <laughs> the next time I wait on hold for an hour. <laughs> okay, <laughs> up to you, Chang, now you can close. Well, I have just one thing to say. The best is yet to come. Let's wait for it. Yeah. Wait for it, okay. Uh, thank you, Chang Wang. Thank you, Martin Hinman. Really appreciate this discussion. I, I really enjoy working with you guys on these things. Thank Aloha. you, Jay. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marty.